Thank you so much for watching Landom Sea Goes There. Please subscribe and hit the like button and the bell notification button. Double Indemnity is a 1944 American crime film that was directed by Billy Wilder. And it was co-written by Wilder and Raymond Chandler. The film stars Fred McMurray, Barbara Stanwyck, and Edward G. Robinson. It's the story of Walter Neff, who's an insurance salesman, whose life is largely devoid of any excitement and thrill. All of that changes, though, when he meets Phyllis Diedrichson. She's the callous wife of a man whom she plans to murder and cash out his accidental death claim. When he is seduced by her into murdering her husband, the two plot a murder scheme that will not go as planned. This plan becomes further complicated when Neff's boss begins to investigate this murder. The movie from its origins had to fight objections to its content, two screenwriters who hated working together, two stars who weren't sure they could handle their respective roles, and an ending that had to be finally changed. When it finally got released in 1944, film history was made. The movie is a masterpiece in the resume of director Billy Wilder and stars Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray. And it's probably the first true example of that classic Hollywood subgenre called film noir. James M. Kane based his novella that the movie is crafted after. In 1927, a married Queens, New York woman and her lover, whose trial he attended while he was working as a journalist in New York, became the basic concept for his writings. In that crime, Ruth Snyder persuaded her boyfriend, Judd Gray, to kill her husband, Albert, after having taken a big insurance policy out on him, one that had a double indemnity clause in it. They were quickly identified as the people that committed the murder, and they were arrested and convicted. And the front page photo of Snyder's execution in the electric chair at Sing Sing has been called the most famous news photo of the 1920s. Raymond Chandler and the director had some struggles on this set. One day during production, Chandler failed to show up for work and he was tracked down at his home. He went through a complete list of reasons why he could no longer work with the director. He stated that Wilder frequently interrupts their work to take phone calls from women and that he would order him to open up the window without saying please. He would stick his baton in his eyes. And the fact that he couldn't stand him wearing a hat in the office bothered him deeply. It was said that unless the director apologized, Chandler threatened to resign completely. Wilder went on to surprise himself and did apologize. And this was probably the first and probably the only time on record in which a producer and director ate humble pie. One of the few times that a screenwriter humiliated the big shots. Initially, Wilder and Chandler had intended to retain much of the book's original dialogue as much as they possibly could. But as they got into it, they realized that the dialogue wouldn't translate well to the screen. So they argued back and forth about this point, Chandler saying that it wouldn't translate, and Wilder disagreeing with him, saying it would. To settle their argument, the director hired a couple of contract players from the studio to read passages from Kane's original dialogue out loud. To the director's astonishment, Chandler was right all along. In the final end, the movie's cynical and provocative dialogue was actually more Chandler and Wilder than it was the original writer, Kane. Edward G. Robinson initially was real reluctant to sign to do this picture, and it pretty much stemmed from the fact that he wasn't keen on being demoted to the third lead. 
Eventually, he finally realized that it was a transition time in his career. And plus, he also considered the fact that he was getting paid the same as Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray for doing less work. In the first scene where Walter kisses Phyllis, we see his wedding ring clearly visible on his hand. Fred McMurray was married at the time, and the ring was not caught or noticed at all until post-production. The blonde wig that Barbara Stanwyck wears throughout the movie was the idea of Billy Wilder. A month into shooting, he suddenly realized how bad it looked. But by then, it was too late to reshoot the earlier scenes. To rationalize this mistake, in later interviews, he claimed that the bad-looking wig was all intentional. The character of Walter Neff was originally named Walter Ness, but once the director found out that there was a real man living in Beverly Hills named Walter Ness, who was actually an insurance salesman, they changed the name to Walter Neff, all this done to avoid being sued for defamation of character. In the novel, the name is Walter Huff. A different ending was originally shot, with Neff being caught by the police and executed, while Keyes looked on in despair. Wilder decided that it would be more poignant and fitting if Neff were to die in his office, with Keyes by his side as he expressed regret for what he had done. When Walter first meets Phyllis, much attention is paid to her ankle bracelet that she wears. Urban legend states that a married woman who wears an anklet primarily does it to show her availability to other men, that she was relatively loose and available for encounters with people other than her husband. Due to strict wartime food rationing, they stationed policemen on the set in the store scene where Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck would have their meetings when they needed to talk. This was all done to make sure that no members of the crew would take any food from the set. Paramount went on to release publicity stills showing four policemen in the store with the two stars. It's really hard for us to imagine a setting like that, but that's the way it was in wartime, with shortages of almost everything. Take some time to go back and watch this classic. I think you'll love it. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.